Thank you so much, Pastor Michael. And good morning, everyone. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Aren't you thankful you have the health and strength to be able to come to church? Amen. I mean, really, just, just that alone? I, I, I'm thankful for so many things. I'm just thankful that I could get out of bed this morning. And uh, that I had the health to, to be able to walk in here and to have First Church. We had great meetings yesterday. And um, we, we had great first service. So I'm, I'm expecting for good things to happen here. I, I really came with an expectation that somebody in this room is going to leave here going, wow, <laughs> guess what happened at church today? And that something major in your life can be. I want you to help me pray, and I'm going to pray in just a moment for our church at home. We have four campuses, and one of them is, uh, you've heard of all the flooding that's going on there. I've had to finally just turn my phone off because they were pinging me with everything. We've got one campus that's totally shut down today, and we have uh, many of our people in boats floating up to homes rescuing people. So it's, uh, it's real. Uh, three of our campuses can meet, but uh, many of them are there just to convene. We've got loads and loads of trucks with boats and fan boats, and we're going out to try to save when you get to about 27 inches of rain on top of the reservoirs that were full from the 10 inches of rain that came up north in our state, all those reservoirs have to be drained a little bit. <clears throat> and those, all when they release the water out of the dams, they come right down on us. And, you know, you got to put your floaties on and go to church. <laughs> That's what it amounts to. You just go in here and say, Lord, help us. So I want to tell you, how wonderful it feels to be uh, at, in this church. I've been coming here for many years now, and I've never felt such a great expectation as I do right now. There is, there's just, uh, this place is pregnant with purpose. It, it's, it's just, and you know, whenever, if, if you want to have a baby, that's one thing, but when somebody starts waddling, uh, and when you, somebody's pregnant, that means we got to start painting. It means we start got to get, get ready because something's coming. It's already happening here. I could feel a flow this morning. Um, whenever the Lord first began to move, I've been pastoring there 39 years, and my father pastored 19 before me. Uh, whenever we first began to feel the great moves of the growth that God was bringing, See, God wants to save everybody. He really does. He doesn't have a problem saving. He has a problem getting his church to believe it and make it happen. And, and that, that's what we want to do is to make it happen. Because the peace that, that you feel in your heart, you got neighbors and cousins and friends and people all around you that you know and many you don't know that need the same thing. They, they, they just don't know that. But when God begins to do that, you, you sense it. You can tell some, something's it, it, it's there. That's what I'm sensing here. So we started making room in our services for people to come. We made room whenever there wasn't even a need to. You, you, it's, it's the idea, if you build it, they will come. If you make space for it, they will come. If nature abhors a vacuum, empty seats in a church abhor a vacuum. So you can't manufacture that. We have to get up here as you have strong leadership, strong teaching, Bible preaching, true to the Word of God, true to the gifts of the Spirit, true to the flow of the Spirit. All of that is healthy. And if it's healthy, it wants to reproduce. But if we don't have room to reproduce, we can't. So we started adding services. Now, let me, let me tell you, it's wonderful and babies sometimes keep you up at night, don't they? And you say, I don't want to be kept up at night. Don't have babies. And I'm telling you, they keep you up when they're no longer babies. They keep you up when they're teenagers. They keep you up when they're 30 years old. And you're going, my God, I thought you were smarter than that by now. I, I don't, I, you know, it, it just goes on and on. And now their side going, my word, Dad, why don't you back off? Or what, you know, that, that's called family. And to do that, we have to make room. So I'm going to show you something right now that is proven 
to take this church up by probably 35 to 40 people almost off the bat. If I could get 10 families in this second service who would agree for the next eight weeks to go to the first service. Today it's raining, we're not quite as full, but I've seen photos in here when you guys are wedged like this. You know, I, I've seen photos, that's how some of the church growth's happening. Y'all bumped into each other and had a baby right here. I, it's been tight. It, it, it's, been, it's been real, real tight. If 10 families would say, we can do that for eight weeks, you know, I don't know. Oh, I, I like to come when it feels full. Well, th that, that's the thinking of churches about me. If you say, I want to create an atmosphere where lost people can be saved, that's church about somebody else. So just having produced this, we went, I mean, we, we started the second one, and it was like, oh, God. And it was, you know, and I love full church. I, I love all, all that. We, we did that. Let me tell you what, you can do more than you think you can. Nod. You're more flexible than you think you are. Nod. And by doing that, it creates room. We ended up with all the growth happening in about five, uh, six year, uh, six to seven year period. We went from having one single service that was like, woohoo, to having five on the weekend. One on Saturday and four on Sunday. I was toast. If you want to talk to me on Monday, you, you better bring oatmeal because I can't even chew. I'm going, uh. But it's not about how I feel. It's about making an opportunity for someone to be saved. Amen. You know what's crazy? The people that would come on Saturday night, some of them couldn't spell God if you spotted them two letters. They didn't have an idea. And then some that came in, you know, at church o'clock on 10 o'clock on Sunday, that's, how, you know, that's church o'clock. Uh, some of those would come. And we just got people to move. Some people wait and come at 1 in the afternoon. They've already gone to IHOP. They've already had all the big slam, or Denny's, big slam breakfast. Somebody went to IHOP, had pancakes. Their kids are, they have had enough sugar. The, 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 the kids team back in the back, they're going, oh, God, here comes the one o'clockers. And they're, they're coming in. Everybody needs a chance to have a service where the Holy Spirit can reach them. And to do that, we've got to create the dynamic. Well, there's plenty of room in First Church. Now, in First Church, I need to take the dynamic of having another 25, 30, 40 people in that service to create the momentum. And then what will happen, some of you will go, you know what, I like this. We come here, we, we, we worship, and then we do this or we do that. And, and some will go, eight weeks done, I'm going back to the, you know, and that, that's fine. But if you don't try it, you might not know how much you like it. And imagine this, it sounds kind of sharp and I don't mean it harsh, but it might not be about you. Well, I've, I'm happy. I feel good. Martha, you feel good? Yeah, we feel good. What if God needs you at first service so you can create some energy in that service that the Holy Spirit can do something and then, oh, you wanted to use me. Ah, I thought you just wanted to feed me. No, we're not just consumers. We're producers. So I'll preach in a minute. We'll talk about good stuff. Right now, I'm talking about how we get your kids to come to church. I'm talking about how we get people, your neighbors, to come to church. I'm talking about how we become a strong Bible-believing church. So, Ten families, be a family of one or a family of, of two or a family of, of a bunch, whatever. I don't know how big your family is. Ten families. Think about it. I'll give you five more seconds. <laughs> one. I got one. One. I need ten families that'll say, I'll come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right there. Here we go. Eight, eight Sundays. That's all I'm asking for. Eight, eight Sundays. There we go. That's five or six where we're at. Is that a hand? That's a hand. Yeah. Okay, well, good. I'm at 11 teen or whatever we're at. I don't know where I'm at. Eight, three, seven, 42. Got it. Hut, hut. I mean, sound like we're paying back. <laughs> Thank you. What you just saw was participation. Thank you. 
Thank you. So now next week, you're going to have about that many more in service. Bring it, Pastor Michael. Come on in here. Let's have church. And then people are going to go, whoa, this place has got energy. And that's what we need to grow. It turns out that way. Usually it has to be some music and starlight and all kinds of fun things to happen. And then babies come. And don't read into that. I'm not going to give you any babies. We're not going to do that. Pastor Michael, Pastor Ned, I honor you in Jesus' name. The work you're doing here is wonderful. I can see the church now when I start driving up on the interstate. There's probably people in this area that are going, I didn't even know there was a church back there. Because you can see it now. Beautiful. Yeah, it's the red brick church that's white now. Oh, yeah, that one. And I'm, I'm just, I'm so grateful for, for what I sense, what I feel, and for the leadership that you, you folks provide, your family uh, provide. Leroy and Carlene Kelly, some of the longest lasting friends I know. This man, when I was a teenager in a choir and I couldn't sing a flip, he gave me a chance to sing in his choir once, and then he moved me to the back and let me sing in the back. <laughs> but he gave me a chance. He gave me a chance. He involved me as a teenage boy. Now, you know, and I thought, oh, that's Brother Kelly. That's Brother Kelly. Now I realize he was just eight and I was only four. I mean, you know, it, it, it was very, very young. But to me, th this man was unbelievable. He, brought, he ran a Sunday school program. He had me in a, in a frog suit. And that's where I got parvo or one of the other, whatever. All the diseases that everybody else had gotten in there, I got in there and just prayed God would deliver me from all of them. I found all kinds of things in that frog suit. Who was in here last? And I got to bring people to church and, and just good stuff. So I am indebted to the Kelly family tremendously. We thank you. Grace Church is better because of what you have invested in our family. We love you. You are top-notch in our books. And Daddy Don... We vote for you, whatever you're running for. I vote for Daddy Don. Daddy Don's going to get to 100 and start counting backwards. <laughs> amazing, amazing. All right, so uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. I thank you for the chance to be in your church. I thank you for the chance, Lord, to open the word. Lord, I pray right now that you're with our folks at home. Give them safety. Let them get to those that are, that are trapped those that are, are unable right now to, to be able to do the things that they need to do. They, they're just having troubles. God, help our team reach them, help them do well. Give me, Lord, the gift of communication because I want to communicate clearly. Lord, give the people sitting here the gift of reception. It wouldn't matter how good the seed is. If it falls on concrete, it's not going to do anything. But if the heart is able to receive the seed the seed will grow what you intended it to grow. I believe that in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. All right, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to help that man. He looks like he needs it. Some of y'all didn't even turn your heads. I'm reaching for you. In February 2023, in the hamlet of Wilmore, Kentucky, a tiny Christian university garnered worldwide attention. After a compulsory chapel service, the speaker at the chapel service sent a text to his wife and said, well, that was another one, that was another stinky sermon in my whole line, long line of stinky sermons. I didn't do well at all. I'll be home in just a little while. That's how he felt about it. But a handful of students decided they weren't through praying. They weren't through worshiping. So they, st they stayed in the church, in the chapel, and as everyone else left, they left it open and they just worshiped. And they worshiped into the afternoon and then they worshiped into the evening. Some of the students that had been working, when they got in that evening to the dorm and they heard they're over there, they went over there. And in a little while, more students came and soon the 1500 seat auditorium was full. And they worshiped all that evening and nobody left. And they worshiped all night. And it began to grow. It got bigger. No one had planned anything. Different ones leading worship. Different ones praying for different things. Different times that they would step up and lead. And the 1,650 
young adults that attend that university crammed into that 1,500 seat auditorium and for the next two weeks, 24 seven, they stayed in there and prayed and had a move of God. People from around the world heard about it and started coming because people are interested in what God's doing. People are interested that God's still alive, that God's still on the throne. And let me tell you, he is. He's, he's feeling well. He's God. He's God alone. He's a committee of one. He voted himself in. He, can't nobody vote him out. And he's God. He has a God complex. He thinks he is God, and he is God. And God alone met them. No one else had something planned. Uh, celebrities started wanting to come. They said, no, thank you. We don't want you. Uh, Tucker Carlson said, I want to come do an interview. They said, no, no, please, please don't come. They didn't have an evangelist. They didn't get Brother Wonderful. They didn't, ha they didn't have somebody come in and do something big. They just went in there and prayed. They worshiped and they lifted up God. And they fulfilled scripture that says, God speaking, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. There's a difference. Come on up here, brother. There's a difference between being driven and drawn. Stand right there. He's a big guy. If I'm drawing him, I'm pulling him. That's drawn. If I'm driving him, I'm shoving him. This is what the enemy does to you. He shoves you. God doesn't shove you. God draws you. God pulls you. God leads you. If you lift him up, he'll lead you into his presence. If you lift him up, you can get very close to him. He doesn't drive you. Satan drives you. He drives you back to what you were in. He drives you to do that stuff. He drives you to say those things. He, but God doesn't drive you. God draws you. And the thing that works for the drawing is for you to do the lifting. We've got no problem with the drawing. God's got that covered. We do have a problem with the lifting. And the lifting is on you and me of going, we're going to worship God. I don't know. I don't really like that song. I don't know what they're singing over there. I, say, hey, I don't feel too good right now. My back's hurting. You want to go to the mall after a while? I, all of that is whether or not we're going to be lifting him up. What would, it, what would, just imagine, what would happen in a room this big if everybody got in here and said, all right, you settled? You good? You good? Kids done? Everybody good? Okay. One hour. Focus on lifting God. I'll tell you what will happen. We'll fill this church up over and over and over because people want to be in the presence of God. Thank you, brother. What will it take to change us? That's a question asked by philosophers, religious people, debaters, politicians, educators, thinking segments of society. They look at society, they look at different segments, and they say, what will it take to change us? And I guess if we look at that, we have to answer another question that goes with that, change us from what? I mean, if we're talking about being changed, you can change to something, change from something, so change from what? Um, one of the things I would first submit to you is one of the things we need to be changed from is inwardness, self-centeredness. It's all about me, 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 me. That's how I tune the instrument. I get up in the morning and I pick up my phone. I haven't put my feet on the bed yet, but I look to see what my friends think about me. I look to see what's in their world. I have not even gone to the restroom yet, but I'm already a little ticked that they would put that out. And you believe that they would do that Insta stuff? And look, and you know that's not right. She doesn't have those kind of pouty lips. That, that, somebody did that stuff. I think, and, and you're already worked up. It's 7 o'clock in the morning. Your feet haven't seen the floor yet, and you've already started putting it into your head, me, 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 how I look, what they say, what they do. What, what would it be if somehow we couldn't worry about what everybody else was worried about if self-absorption is something we could be changed from? Now, I'm telling you, it is. There is we can do that. We have the world filled right now with influencers. That's what they're called, influencers. That means whatever they do, they influence many people to do it. So, oh, they must be statesmen. No, we don't have any of those right now. Uh, they, they, they must be this. They're, they're, no, a lot of times they're people that can part their hair. A lot of times they can put on clothes. A lot of times they can go someplace and eat. 
and the next day the establishment is filled to overflowing because Susie Q ain't here. Well, who's Susie Q? Oh, she's an influencer. What does she do? Nothing. <laughs> well, I mean, has she, has she discovered water? No. No. What? what, what? No. It, have you seen how she looks? And we are influenced by people sometimes that you wonder exactly why am I following you? How do we break the cycle of inwardness? Better question maybe is what will change people? Catastrophe hasn't seemed to work. Recessions, short time. Depressions. A pandemic. We had a, we had a good sized pandemic came through. For a little while, I mean, some people got crazy. They're still staying at home. Others, others don't. I mean, you say, oh, you just judge them. No, I'm just saying we, we each find something to believe in, and, and you go with it. How about I show you something from Scripture that will change you? That would be a whole lot better. That was a rhetorical question. The children of Israel had what God had called an ark. It's called the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark of the Covenant was what God used before he filled people with his spirit. He used an, in, an instrument like this right here. These wooden staves on both sides are what the Levitical priesthood would carry the Ark with. They lifted it up and put it on their shoulders. And with this on their shoulders, it's a box. It's not very large. Um, Inside of the box, several things, I'm not going to go into all that, but there's manna, the tablets, broken tablets of, uh, of, of what Moses wrote, the Ten Commandments, those are there. Uh, several things, Aaron's rod, there's several things in there. The top lid is called the mercy seat. On top of that top lid are the two cherubim that are looking down on mercy because when they realize God's there, they know the only place to put their eyes is down on the mercy of God. And so they are, that, that, this, is, this is what they have. The, the symbol of God in the Old Testament was this container that had what was called the Shekinah presence of Almighty God. For the Hebrew people, it had great theological significance. For their neighbors, they just saw it as the ultimate good luck charm. Because wherever the ark went, the children of Israel prospered. When they went into battle, if they carried the ark, they won. If, if, they, if they worshiped around the ark, God did mighty and wonderful things. So the kingdom of the Philistines, they decided, we want that ark. You know, it's like the, the uh, lucky rabbit's foot. Some people carry a lucky rabbit's foot. Have you noticed that rabbits never carry those? <laughs> and if it was so lucky, what about the three-legged rabbit now? How's he feeling? <laughs> maybe, maybe it's not quite as lucky as you thought. What a lucky for him. So the, the, uh, the people from Philistia, they said, we want this ark. And so when they defeated Israel in battle once, they took the ark as spoil of war. And when they took the ark back to their temple, they put it in the temple of Dagon, their god. They parked it in there, Dagon and Baal and these other gods are on stone, they're, they're stone gods on pedestals. They're, they put them around it and they put the ark in the center and they were like, this, this, is, this, is, this is really great. This, this is going to be, going to be wonderful. But what they didn't understand was if you mishandle God's stuff, there can be a high price to pay because God doesn't like people to handle his stuff. So they had the ark, and they put it in to their, to their temple. The next morning, they went in, and all their gods were face down, bowing to that god, the god of the ark. And they were like, oh, this doesn't look good. So they propped their gods back up. I hope you're not serving a god you have to prop up. I hope you're serving a god. I mean, whatever you're serving, be sure that that god's available at 2 in the morning when the baby's got a fever. That's the kind of god you want. If, if, and, and you want a God that you can call on. The next day after they set their gods up, they go back in there. Their gods are now on the floor again, and their hands are broken off. So now we have a God who doesn't even have any hands that they have to carry. If you're delivering your gods, you might want to go back to the God market and check to see what you bought. Because you ought to have a God that's able to deliver you. 
And they, they now go, okay, we, 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 we got a problem here. David comes to power, leading the Hebrew people, and says, I want to go back and get our ark. That's ours. I want to bring it back home. And he does. He, he goes after the ark, but he's handling the ark nonchalantly, just like, just like they, they were. He's just, you know, however, we'll get it. And the cost for mishandling God's stuff, again, is very high. Remember, if something belongs to God and you decide to handle it how you want to, there is a price to pay. It seems God's pretty particular about how holy things are handled. So David brought an ox cart, just a, just a flatbed. He brought an ox cart, two oxen pull it, just a, just a two-wheeled two cart. He puts the ark on it like he's moving some freight. It's, you know, it's on a flatbed. He's just going to move it back, back to Jerusalem. Now, God's law was very clear. Only the Levitical priesthood could carry this ark. They're the only ones that can do the worship. They're the only ones that can carry it. They're the only ones that can be around it. And David went, yeah, okay. Go get it, put it on a cart, and bring it home. And when they put it on that cart and they started coming home, they hit a bump in the road. The ark kind of shook a little bit. A young man named Uzzah reached up to touch it, to hold it back, fell dead. Because God thinks he's God. And he thinks what he says is what he said. David, he's scared and, and angry. And so now he simply just turns into one of the first places of substance he can find to drop the ark off. Obviously, he's messed up. Something's wrong here. He's scared of it. And, and then, you know, it just wasn't supposed to be this way. This is his, this is his coming out as a king. And now... You got, you got somebody dead, and so he, he finds, he's still in Philistia now, and so he, he finds a place, it must have been big enough to have substance enough that so he would be able to take in his entourage, and he goes in, and he leaves the ark at a house. He leaves it at the house of a man named Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom is, is a, Phil, a Philistine. Obed-Edom is not a Hebrew. He doesn't worship their God. He, he's, a, he's a Philistine, but he had a nice porch, and so they just dropped the ark at there at his porch. And he already knows, you touch it, you die, so he's smart enough not to touch it. And he already knows, if you put it in your temple, your gods, we don't want to take it to the temple. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Uh, kids, stay away from it. And there it is, David leaves. Everywhere it's gone in Philistia, it has wreaked havoc. But it doesn't wreak havoc at Obed's house. It, it, some, something different happens at Obed's house. The scripture says, 2 Samuel 6 and 11, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed. Obed-Edom, and all his household. <laughs> Everybody else is dying. In fact, I mean, in one of the towns that they took it to, in, in, in Philistia, one of the towns they took it to, the town fathers said, called and said, come get it. No, you bring it. We can't move. Come get it. <laughs> and you need to read why. Look in the King James. It says they had emrods. All the men had emrods. Look up emrods. Whole town had hemorrhoids. You think God doesn't have a sense of humor? I don't want you to mess with my stuff. I'll do what I want to. Okay, now this is your problem. Y'all come get it. I ain't moving. Sit down. I ain't sitting down. Stand up. Can't stand up straight. Fight. I ain't putting on a sword. Come get this ark and get it out of here. I'm just telling you. Well, it works for them. It ain't working for me. I'm telling you, if you mess with God's stuff. Right, there's a lot I could do with that. Of, of what is God's stuff and you're using it. Oh, he won't mind. He, he, know, he knows. I, you know, I, would, I would pay that to him, but I need it this week. Okay, you mess with God's stuff and just say him. Now it's in Obed-Edom's house. And he's blessed. There's a blessing at Obed-Edom's house. Now, why did it not bless the others? 
it has to be something about Obed. Because everything else is the same. There's got to be something about Obed's house. Now, here's the scripture, 2 Samuel 6 and 12. And it was to told King David, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that belongs to him. Whew. That ark sitting in his house made his kids act better. His camels grew two humps. He, he, uh, everything that he had got blessed. He, he's, he, he's, I mean, good stuff's happening. All of his household. When's the last time everybody in your house was acting right? When's the last time that you, you, you had a good chance to fuss and just passed it up? You, you didn't, I didn't need to. Why? It feels too good. I mean, she pit slow. I could have come around. That, that could have been a three-hour Saturday morning, but no, I, it feels good. Who, who, who needs war when you can have love and peace? And, that, oh, uh, and this is going on here. It said, the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him. This is what they told David because of the ark of God. So David says, all right, that's enough of that. David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. So for 90 days, Obed-Edom wakes up to the presence of God in his house. Turn off that news. You don't need, need 24-7 news. They, after about two minutes, they're going to start repeating. Turn off the news. They're not going to tell you about the storm. They're going to tell you about somebody who saw the storm and somebody whose family who saw the storm. And in a little while, you're going to have people that are making storm noises. Oh, yeah, it came through with whoo. When they're making storm noises, you've already heard all the news. Turn off the news. Turn on something that worships God. Do you, you think that Obed-Edom, like, went out in the mornings? And you know, he didn't touch it. What is it about this? What is it about this heart? Beautiful. Oh, it's got a warm feeling. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. And obed Edom just started worshiping. <laughs> you say, you're making it up. No, I don't make up stuff. I've got scripture to prove everything. Stop being so cynical. Listen to the whole thing. What, what, what do you, how, how do you figure that, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it, it, it mm. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. And what happens is Obed's house and his heart begin drawing. How great thou art. Daddy, what you singing? I don't know. It's a song I heard some Hebrews singing a long, long time ago. I don't even remember if I know all the words, but how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior. Daddy, I feel that. Yeah, I do too, don't you? Wow. Well, Daddy, what? Uh, don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it. Just, let's just walk around it. Amazing grace, how sweet. The sound, Daddy, I feel that. Don't I, son, I feel it. Daddy, are you crying? I think I am. <laughs> Why? I, I don't know, but it seems like when we talk about it, it, it kind of pulls. It, it just, I don't know. It, it's, like, it's like it's warm when you talk about it. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. <laughs> but now I am found. I was blind. But now. I'm here 
ever heard daddy sing like that? I ain't never heard your daddy sing anything like that. And the word gets back to David. Every, everything that obey touches, it's, it's working. I have a question for you. Again, what, if anything, will move people to God? I, I mean, why? If, if anything will, what will do that? David says, all right, let's prepare to move the ark back. Let's take it back. Let, 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 let's go back. We're going back to Jerusalem. This time, he consults the book. This time, he doesn't send an ox cart. He says, all right, let's get our stuff together. Priesthood, come. Levites, come. Uh, we got, we got to plan this event. Get your musicians ready. Get, get, get everybody ready. We've got a parade. We're going to bring him back. We're going to need gatekeepers. Somebody's got to open the gate and let us in. We need traffic control. Somebody's going to let us in. Some people have to park in the A parking lot. Some will be down on the B. Some will be down on the hill and see. We're going to have to get them golf carted back up here. Why? Because it's going to get full, and we got, got to make it happen. Well, I don't want to park down there. Then don't see the ark. I mean, if, 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 if you don't, I mean, well, I, it's amazing. We'll stand in line for an hour and a half to get in to see a game, but I don't want to park in the bottom parking lot. <laughs> Stop and think. Whatever's center and whatever's drawing is what you actually st start worshiping. And, and David gets them together. And he did it wrong last time. So I want you, I want to hear, I, I want you to hear. I'm going to tell you how he did it right this time. First Chronicles 15 and 2. Everybody say read. read. That wasn't everybody, but I'll try you again. Then David said, no one, everybody say no one. No. I, want you, I want to make sure you're clear. No one, he said, may carry the ark of God but the Levites. Because the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and to do the ministering before him forever. He's really clear now. He's really clear. Uz is dead. He, he knows what's happened. That's been a national scandal. And he's now, he's clear. All right. It's just them. David said, no, I'm going to get really clear. Let's uh, uh, <coughs> listen close, folks. Verse 3. And David gathered together. All Israel, David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. See, I could spend a little while there on how strong our Sunday is, is going to be determined by how well we prepare for it. That we are prepared, that you've been thinking all week long, I'm going to go into church and I'm going to bring this worship to God. Oh, yeah, I, that, that wreck, ooh. That could have been me. If I had just touched the gas, they'd have T-boned me, but I just held for a second. I don't know why, but I'm keeping that. And Sunday, I'm walking in prepared to give God a glory for what he did for me. That's what he said. He, that, that they prepared for it. Then David assembled the children of Aaron and all the Levites. Here we go. Of the sons of Kohath, Uriel, the chief, and 120 of his brethren. Of the sons of Merari, Isaiah, the chief, and 220 of his brethren. Of the sons of Gershom, Joel, the chief, and 130 of his brethren. Okay, Pastor Rhett, we got it. Lots of people. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't run past the details. They're, they're good ones. Of the sons of Azelophan, Shemaiah the chief, and 200 of his brethren. Of the sons of Hebron, Eliel the chief, and 80 of his brethren. And of the sons of Uziel, Amenadab. You know, some of y'all have got babies coming. You're looking for a good name. Amenadab. Grab it. Grab Amenadab. You won't have a lot of people fighting you over it, and it'll always be yours. Right, you'll, you'll have Amenadab. Because right now, I know some of y'all are going to the pharmacy, and you're getting medicine boxes, and you're reading the back of them. We're going to name her Fennel Clinics today. Clinics. Anyhow. Of the sons of Uziel, Aminadab, the chief, and 112 of his brethren, verse 11. And David called for Zadok and Abathar, the priest. Boy, can you tell? He's, he's on it now. It's Levites. Verse 12, verse 11. He called for Zadok and Abathar, the priest, and for the Levites. He said, be, are you Levitical? Are you, you Levite? Get over here. Uriel, Asiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab, David chose 782 Levitical priests to bring the ark back to Jerusalem the right way. Don't tell me God's not concerned with how we do church, how we handle service, what we say, how well it looks, what, ha oh, God's, God's really concerned about that. Because if we enter into this like we do Walmart, and I'll take some of that, and I'll take some of that. He says, uh-uh, you're not going to treat me like that. You need to treat me like holy is the Lord because he is. And you walk in here, your kids don't come here and play here like they do at Target because this isn't Target. It's a house of God, and we do it right in here. That's what he was. He was setting all this up. 
Man, he's got the Levites. They're on their game, isn't it? Here we go. Verse 15. Here you go. More Levites. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. They are in uh, Obed-Edom's patio area. Everybody's cleared out. Furniture has been moved out. Big crowd. Tents over here. Everybody's ready. And the priest in that solemn moment, get up on their shoulder. And you see nothing but Levites, far and east. Here we go. We're going to do it right. And David is, in fact, if you read later, this is where David takes seven steps in worship, seven steps in worship. Here he goes. All right. They're about to move. Let's watch them. This is a Levitical parade. Verse 16. Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites, to appoint their brethren to be the singers, accompanied by instruments of music, stringed instruments, harps, cymbals, by raising the voice with resounding joy. That's why we sing loud in here, because the Lord told us to. That's why we worship vibrantly, openly, because he told us to. When he said play cymbals, what do you think? No. Cymbals. So the Levites appointed He-Man, and if you ever wonder if God wants men to be men, this, this guy's name is He-Man. The, the Levites appointed He-Man, the son of Joel, and of his brethren, and Asaph, the son of Berechiah, and of their brethren. These are just the musicians here. And the sons of Merari, Ethan, the son of Cushai. Now, see, I, I've gone through 17 verses telling you exactly who is leading Man, David's going to get it right this time. He says, all right, now, second rank. Wow. Wow. Verse 18, and with them, the brethren of the second rank. See, we don't have anybody who wants to be in the second I'm not in the second rank. Well, then you don't get to be in the party. Okay, well, I'll be second rank. That's what I thought. Here's in the second rank. Zechariah, Ben, Jeziel, Shemaramoth, Jehiel, Uni, Eliab, Benaniah, Masaiah. Listen to these Levites. Mattatiah, Alephala, Mikniah. Hold up here. Hold up here. I've, I've spent about five minutes of this sermon, or 30, whatever it's been, uh, telling you about the Levites. And he ain't a Levite. He's a Philistine. Oh, we, we got trouble. Obed-Edom and Jeliel, that's his, his problem, that's his name. Jeliel, the gatekeepers. Did you see that? The gatekeepers are the ones who open the doors for the carts and for the traffic to go in and out. They're the ones that when the donkeys went by, they ran out and scooped a little poop. They're the ones that kept it clean. They're the ones that said, step back from the rail, step back from the rail, keep it. But now, but this guy's a big, big owner of, of, of a place big enough to park the ark whenever it's a national problem. And now he, he's, he's in, he's, now he's behind the people of the second rank. But that didn't seem to bother him. He, he's cleaning the, the, the streets. He's one of 18 porters and gatekeepers listed. He's not a Levite. He's not even Hebrew. He's a Philistine from Gath. Ding, 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 ding. A Philistine from Gath. David's met one of those one time. Seemed like everybody from Gath ought to hate little David because David killed a giant from Gath named Goliath. Goliath of Gath. That's probably cousin to Obed-Edom. And instead of Obed going, I hate that man, Obed said, can, 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 I, can I open the gate? Well, you're not a Levite. I, I know, I know. But, but for 90 days, I woke up every day to that presence of God. For 90 days, I've just walked around that, and I know I'm not all that, but I'll do anything to be able to stay close to that ark. You just... And it won't matter what the job is. I'm in. I, the answer is yes. Now, what are we talking about? I want in. I want to be a part of that. Mm. 
Have you ever noticed that nobody in the orchestra ever fights over second chair? Um, get your clothes, Martha. We're not going to let them treat us like that. Well, then you won't be able to see the art. He's not only a gatekeeper, he's chosen to be a praise singer. Verse 18 says he was of the second rank. So he, he's like, best, like Bishop Kelly put me. I wasn't, on the sec, I wasn't in the first row. He put me in the back. Then he put me over on the edge of the choir. So I couldn't sing where the flip. But he let me stay in his choir, but he had me way over on the outside. But I'm preaching today at his church because he didn't kick me out of his choir, but he gave me a spot when I didn't deserve a spot. I was just a 14-year-old kid, but he went, I'll, I'll take a chance on that kid and put him back over in the corner. He gave me my, a lead, and I, the things I used to do, I don't do no more. Places I used to go, I don't go no more. And I was supposed to play one more, and I was, y'all, I, you had me down to one last phrase. I was supposed to say, and the place that I used to go, I don't, I don't go no more. There's been a great change. That's what I was supposed to have done. I went, I, used to, I don't do no more. And you went, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Places I used to go, I don't go no more. I go, the things I used to say, I don't say no more. And you just, <laughs> and he just took the choir and kept going. And then I noticed later he had the mic, and he just worshiped me out and just worshiped the mic over to Mark. And then he just worshiped me. Bishop Kelly just worshiped me back up into the choir. And I, I just, no more, that's been a great change. And he just he had moved me that. That's great change. I know there's been a great change in me. And I sang from the back. Because I wasn't good enough to sing from the front. You kick everybody out of your life who's not just perfect, you're not going to have a very big life. But if you get a hold of something like this, you can have, a, you can have an old man eat him in your house, and he can say, "I worship you, I worship you, I honor you, I praise you, I lift you up." First Chronicles fifteen and two. Then David said, "I hear thunder. I, I'm doing good." <laughs> David said, "No one. I'm in. I'm in the book, folks." Hope you brought your Bible. If not, I hope you're writing this down. If not, I hope you have a really good memory that you can remember eternal scripture that's going to change your life. You're just going to, but now remember where you parked too. <laughs> yeah, that was sarcasm. Verse 2, David said, no one can carry the ark but the Levites. The Lord's chosen them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him. But in verse 18, Obed-Edom, Philistine, is a gatekeeper. Here's what I'd like you to see. He was happy to be a cleaner in the house of God as long as it kept him in the house of God. If it kept him close to the ark, he was like, I'm good with that. And that's why he's permitted to be a praise singer. He's permitted to be with the praise singer as the, with the band as they bring it back home. And so that means he runs out of the bathroom with those rubber gloves and he pulls them off and goes, sorry, 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 excuse me, excuse me. And walks right up in the choir and there are people go, whoa, I, it was on my, uh, I took off the gloves. Hallelujah. Ha! He just singing away. But now he's also, uh, we got to clean up on, uh, yeah, okay, I'll be right back. Y'all keep singing. Well, I'm not going to do that if they don't give me a better spot. I'm, I'm just, stop. Stop. You're going you're gonna to miss it. The, 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 you, you, it's easy to miss this. God's not judging you by the bloodline that everybody else is judging you by. He's not even really looking how much ability you have, but he is sure checking out your availability. He's sure checking out whether you're in that for the, for the, the reason of seeing it through. So my question was, what, if anything, will change us? And I'll give you that answer. Living in the presence of God will rearrange your priorities and it'll cause you to reexamine your values. Not visiting two Sundays a month. Living in the presence of God. Asbury University, less than a dozen students 
hungry for the presence of God, brought national attention, international attention. Good run, Obed. Yeah, but he's not through. First Chronicles 15 and 19. The singers, Heman, Asaph, Ath and Ethan, were to sound the symbols of bronze. Zechariah, Aziel, Shemiramoth, Je Jehiel, Uni, Eliab, Messiah, and Benaniah with strings according to the Alamoth. Mattathiah, El Eliphala, Mikniah. Well, bless your heart. Look who's in the band. What's he doing? He's playing a harp. What's that right there? He's playing a harp. He's taking off his rubber gloves and he's going, bring, bring. Well, I thought you were a gatekeeper. I, I have to hurry. I do that, then I run up here, I do that. And I, and I sing, I sing way over there though. They don't, they don't put me up front. But I, I can see the ark and I'm close to the presence of God. And as long as I can be close to that, some of you are waiting for God to call you to a ministry. Here, this is the ministry. The God's call is the need. The need we have to double this church. The need we have to have two services full. Then the need we'll have to have three. The need we have for you to earn a lot more money. You've got to earn a lot more money. We've got to build parking lots here. Where's that money coming from? It's gonna come from you. That means you have to be blessed of God. So you've got to get into this blessing thing. Well, I don't want to ask me for money. Oh, if you're blessed, you don't care, right? If you're blessed, you give. And so you've got to be praying, God, put me in the flow of what you're doing. Then there's no begging. It'll be like Moses finally saying, stop, don't bring any more money. Good Lord, I don't have any place to put it. Stop. That's what Moses did when they were, they were building this ark. He said, don't do any more of that. I don't need any of that. And now we're saying, if we, if, I'm telling you, if we build it, they will come. If we, get the, if we get better scooter mobiles to get them up the hill here, if we, whatever, well, I don't think we can do that. Stop telling us what we can't do. Start helping us with what we can do. What we can do is put the ark here. What we can do is every time we come together, we can lift him up. What we can do is create a draw in this place, and there will be a magnetism that'll go out of here and people on the interstate. I know it's happened at our church. There's people up there that say, I don't know. I was just driving by and went, I'm going to go in here. Well, they said, why? I don't know. I just felt like I needed to come. I know it's like a magnet going over a piece of metal. If it goes over it, it just picks it up. God's got a powerful spirit and somebody who's hungry, he'll pick them up. And we've got to have a place for them. We've got to have a deal. So we've got to have this. We've got to have that. Now, crowds don't get this sermon. Denominations don't get this sermon. Only individuals get it. My question to you. Look at your time. Look at your calendar. Look at your checkbook. There's two things you can look at. Look at your checkbook. Look at your date book. That tells you what's valuable to you. And you look. You You, you decide. And then my question is, what you're doing, is it worth spending your life on? Because this is your life. This, you're not, this isn't a trial run that you're going to come back and do it. No, this is your life. Are you spending it in the way that you believe is going to make the most difference for the kingdom of God and fulfill you? Then Obed-Edom puts down his guitar, verse 22, Shenaniah, leader of the Levites, was the instructor in charge of music because he was skillful. Thank God for skillful musicians, skillful singers. Barakai and Elkanah were the doorkeepers for the ark. Sh Shabania, Jehoshaphat, Nathaniel, Amasi, Zechariah, Benaniah, and Eliezer, they are the priests, and they are there to blow the trumpets before the ark of They're there to blow the trumpets before the ark of God. And Obed Edom, he's everywhere. He's everywhere. Because if you ever get infected with worshiping God and the presence of God drawing you, there won't be anything else that will matter in your life. You want to be in his presence. And now he's a doorkeeper. In fact, he's one of the 12, I mean, one of the four permanent doorkeepers 
Obed is a Philistine from Gath. He's not a Levite. Apparently, if you get close enough to God, he'll make an exception to his own rule. Well, people like me, we don't get that. Well, if you, he doesn't get that either. Why, why would he get that? No. He just kept slipping up close to the presence of God. And when you start worshiping God, <clears throat> he'll, he'll, he'll move out other things. He'll, he'll, he'll move other people out of the way. He, he wants to hear. He, he wants to know. You know what moves people to God? Is the presence of God. That's why we have to protect the presence of God in this house. That's why we come in here and, yeah, we're exuberant and we're happy, but we're protecting the presence of God here. Everything here is done decent and order. You're out of order, we'll stop you. Some of y'all are like, oh, I don't want anything crazy to happen. We got crazy fixtures here. Don't worry about it. Because you, you can't open the door to the Spirit and not have a few people that read it differently. No problem. I would rather have to cool off a few than to throw matches the rest of my life trying to light a few. <clears throat> so now, 1 Chronicles 16 tells us the festival's over. The ark has been moved back. It's now back in Jerusalem where it was supposed to be. Everybody goes home. like driving by the stadium the day after the game. It was the source of excitement. Everybody's going home now. So the scripture tells us about it. First Chronicles 16, 37. So he left Asa, or Asaph and his brothers there before the ark of the Lord to minister. Y'all seeing this? Here it is to minister before the ark regularly as every day's work required. In verse 38, guess who? Festival's over. And Obed-Edom with 68 of his brethren. Whoa, 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 whoa. Before he just integrated into the Levites. Well, apparently you stay close enough to God and your family will be so impacted. <laughs> David said, I know what we said on the Levites, but I've watched this Obed-Edom character. And let me tell you, I've seen his family and they look like a bunch of salty people to me. I think our ark is safer with obed <laughs> with Obed-Edom and his family watching over it than a bunch of these Levites that just do it because it's their job. You leave Obed-Edom and his family as the elite force around the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible says, and they were there to be the permanent gatekeepers. The faithfulness of Obed-Edom setting God's center and worshiping him with everything he has. And now 68 Philistines. You can't be here? I know. I, I, I know what your book says. I got it. I know. But I can because I'm with him. And he has been with the presence. And the king said, if he's been with the presence of God around the ark, that we can do that so Keep moving along, move along, keep the line going, keep the line going. And the roped off area, the Philistines were the ones that set the rope. Yeah. What are you doing? I'm Obed Edom's grandson. Oh, okay. Uh, and what are you doing here? I'm, I'm his uncle. It's about dropping names. Don't you know those 68 Philistines? Because the Israelites wanted to, wanted to kill them all. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, I'm an Obedian. Oh, yeah, leave me alone. Because Obed Edom lifted the Lord. When's the last time you worshiped God with abandon? 
where you just took a few minutes and you, you, you turned your phone off and, and you, didn't, you didn't think of anybody else <clears throat> and you just turned your attention to God. And you just thought of his goodness to you. You got so many friends that died and you're still here. A car wreck happened and you're here. One of your buddies OD'd. You should have, you would have, you were right there, but you're here. Your mama had two steel bursts. You weren't. You're here. You were told you weren't loved, but here, you kind of like Obed. When's the last time you moved out everything and just, here you go, God, everything I've got. All my life you have been faithful. Sing it, concert of one. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath I am able, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. When's the last time you did that? Oh my life. When's the last time you did that? Just back.
Have you ever considered that God's mercy and goodness and grace is chasing you? The enemy's tried to kill you and God's grace has been right there at the right time. Every time they just knock it off. Not the time somebody was going to do something, God just, uh, no, why? Because God's goodness is at time. Because I've been lifting him up. And if I lift him up, he'll draw me. And so every time I lift him, he draws. And I'm close enough to him that he's able to step in when I need him and to do what I can't do for myself. So, what about you? Go all in. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. When did it start? The moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing. Of the goodness of God. All my life. It's all my life. Oh! 
time you say it, but I say to me. He is so wonderful. I don't know about you, but to me. So wonderful. See, it's a new old song for some of you. To me, he is so wonderful. Yeah. To know that Jesus is mine. You can do that. Say it. To me. at the center of my joy. If you know that, I'm going All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my I got some brothers and sisters that know that. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment. I was over at Edom, and that was the ark, and everybody, everybody had stepped away. Nobody's watching me, are they? You're the reason I find contentment in the street. When you begin to See, you, you can write to God your own song. doesn't matter how well you can sing it if you're lifting him up. If you can, if you can clear your mind out. Oh, if, you, if you can. Because I, I, I'm telling you, what, what I'm telling you right now is I'm trying to set you up. Because when I come back a year from now, there's going to be 250 to 300 more people that are in this church because you've made room for them. You, you've, you've made room for them. And that'll matter to you if you realize that those people are your friends. People that you wouldn't believe right now that would even consider church. You are why I find contentment in the simple things of life. You're the music in the meadows and the streams, in the voices of my children, of my family and my home. You're the source and finish of my highest dream, Jesus, you're 
were the center of my joy. All the good presents come from you. You're the heart of my heart. I do. Jesus, you're the center. About a savior who came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I think everybody ought to sing something. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and I won the victory. Oh, victory! In Jesus, my Savior forever, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming love. I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath Of his cleansing power revealing and how he made the lame to walk again and he calls the blind to see and then I cried dear Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and sometimes Jesus came and broke to me oh victory every great head